Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bookmarks, uh, where we always keep your place. My name is Callum. Uh, I am hosting this episode with my dear friend and amazing, I was going to say companion, but co-host, Amelia. <laughs> Welcome to the new Doctor are, Who. You know, what are... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are companions, if not co-hosts in the game of life? <laughs> Fighting Daleks. Oh, wow. I don't know. I, well, I, if, if we get this poetic this early, we must be talking about books. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're, video games, poetic? No, Never. no. we, we got to talk about books here on this. Video games? Uh, what with the swords and guns and stuff? Can't be poetry. I started playing Mass Effect last night. Art? Time. In my... <laughs> There's, it's impossible to make someone who looks good in Mass Effect. Like, I've, I've gone through the character created with a dude, and you cycle through the presets, and it's like, which... <laughs> what 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 slab do you want for your face? <laughs> yeah, my golden rule is I always play with a helmet on, and that's that's just it. I just play with the helmet on, you know, like whatever. I don't, you know, I don't play those games to look at my face. Oh, I'm the exact opposite uh, in, so. in that I I carve a perfect face and then I put a helmet on. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get randomly sniped, you know, in in battle. Uh, but yeah, before we diver- diverge into the Mass Effect podcast, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we previously did a stream, uh, a book stream, uh, which was basically a prototype version of this. Uh, we decided to do a recording, uh, not because we don't enjoy having an audience, but I think it's just easier to stay on task when we're not trying to constantly worry about stream dying on us. Uh, yeah, the, the last time and, we did uh, this, we had some you know, technical difficulties. I mean, we're still probably going to have technical difficulties with Discord, but... <laughs> yeah, but, like, we, we won't have to worry um, it, about it as much because we live in a country that's an internet dead zone. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so the base, to refresh your memory, or for those of you who are just joining us, uh, for those of you who are just joining the channel, uh, welcome. <laughs> um, hey. This uh, format uh, basically will be that Callum and I have both read something, uh, a book, a manga, uh, something like that, Pamphlets, and we're going to talk about it. Uh, the, <laughs> the graffiti on the back of a, a, a toilet stall. <laughs> um, the stars. So, <laughs> yeah, Callum is big into uh, astronomy, guys. It, and, uh, that that's like a hidden fact about Callum. Yeah, I have um, to I have to navigate so, with it because I can't read maps. <laughs> um. So um. Yeah. So we're gonna talk about this. Uh. We will be giving indications about spoilers. Um, I don't know if you're going to be very spoiler-heavy for your review, yeah, Callum. I mean, well, like now. Like now. Now is the indication that there will be spoilers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. There will be plenty of spoilers, so uh, our recommendation is go read these books if you really want to know about them. I will try to keep the most important spoilers out of the, the uh, sort of my discussion, but I do need to spoil a little bit of the story to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, my, my um, thing is a bit and- long, so I'm not going to be talking about every individual part of it. Uh, so I, I'm not going to be spoiling details, but I, I will give it like a general synopsis. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, so I will be uh, jumping this off today, uh, and I'm starting with a book yeah. that what did you is, read? I think very interesting. So I read The Hollow Ones by Guillermo del Toro and Chuck Hogan. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Guillermo del Toro. Also writes books, apparently. <laughs> and uh, he teamed up with a crime novelist by the name of Chuck Hogan, who Caleb did mention he sounds like a wrestler. He sounds like two wrestlers did a Dragon Ball Z fusion dance, and then you ended up with a Chuck Hogan. <laughs> I, I literally just um, said it sounded like two wrestlers fused together, but Emilio and I are so in sync as people that he, <laughs> he knew what I meant. He added the Dragon Ball Z fusion dance, and it's perfectly what I had in my head. <laughs> yeah, see, you know, uh, we're we're, co- we're we're not just co-hosts. We're you know? companions. I guess we're companions. <laughs> <laughs> the next season of Doctor Who, it, it, an idiot doctor. I mean, the, I don't know, the, you the know? current next season of Doctor Who has a black doctor. Okay, so the, the yeah, so that would that would that would set the internet on fire. Um, I, everyone's pretty excited about it. He's the guy from uh, Sex Education. I forget his full name. Oh, that. I, I know the guy that you're talking about. Yeah, okay, so Guillermo del Toro and Chuck Hogan, very interesting combination, because I will I will argue that the fusion of esteemed horror director and crime novelist mirrors the themes of the book about a uncanny and strange partnership. It does not so, take place in a small So the year is kind of, <laughs> kind of. It's modern times, 
follow it, and we are following the uh, story of rookie FBI agent Odessa Hardwick. That's a great Hardwick? name. Hardwicky. <laughs> yeah, Odessa is a great name. I really do like Odessa uh, as a as a first name. She and her veteran partner Walt Lepo are in a diner in New Jersey when suddenly they get a record uh, not a recording they see on the news that there's like a terrorist situation going on at an airport a guy has stolen a plane and he's going on a rampage throughout the city what chasing da- yeah yeah chasing down some leads wait no um, no, no, no hang on hang on f- hang on hang on <laughs> we you you kind of glossed over what do you mean going on a rampage is he like flying the yeah, plane so- into things well, yeah, so what he's what this guy is doing is he's got a gun and every so often he's flying the plane and just shooting out the window with the gun. What? Are you <laughs> yeah. serious? I'm, yeah, I'm serious. He, he's terrorizing people. You know, is this like a uh, a the, prop the, plane? It, it's like a it's like a small one propeller, like a Cessna. You know, like a plane like that. Not like he didn't hijack like a, a, a seven four seven or something. Yeah. But- <laughs> Although, to be fair, if a Boeing <laughs> fell out of the sky, you know, it, it, it's yeah. shitty Boeing engineering, you know, it, I don't think terrorism would be involved. Uh, but, like, I just, uh, so, I, I was imagining, like, a, <laughs> like a, like an Airbus, and he's, he's leaning out the window, <laughs> shooting it, like, this is not gonna work, but... <laughs> you know, you can't open those windows on, on, the, on those That's planes. not really the you problem, know, actually- Emilio, it's that he's going very fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so a ter- this guy's just doing terrorism, like this random act of violence. Nobody knows what's going on. Um, apparently, it could be like a government employee gone rogue. They track him down, uh, and there's a really tense situation where uh, Odessa and Walt are in the suspect's house. Uh, he's killed his family, and in the process of like killing his children, there's a tense standoff with the you know police. Uh, you know, he gets killed. But then, to her surprise, Walt seemingly turns on the um, uh, on the uh, on Odessa and tries to kill her with a knife, and she's forced to shoot him as well. Mm. Suddenly, her entire life is thrown flips turned upside down, uh, and she's put under investigation by the FBI, uh, basically because she uh, was involved in a, a shooting of her partner. That's a rough right? way to treat uh, the princess of Bel Air. <laughs> <laughs> She's the princess of New Jersey, all right. <laughs> um, so yeah, so while her life is currently, you know, flipped turned upside down, uh, she is given a low-level assignment to basically clear out the office of a, a FBI agent called Earl Solomon. He had a stroke. He's in the hospital. He's in the process of slowly dying. Uh, but then it turns out that he was involved in some really weird stuff. I let me just say right off the bat, I really enjoyed this book. I felt like it was a good blend of supernatural and crime elements, right? Um, you have somebody who understands horror, Del Toro, and you've got somebody who understands crime fiction, Hogan. And I think the two of them uh, are able to weave a compelling supernatural mystery that also, independent of all of that stuff, also stands as a crime mystery. I think that's quite rare. So the, the story takes... There are multiple perspectives. Um, there's flashbacks to the 1960s uh, when we follow young Earl Solomon... Uh, who's investigating the lynching of a white man in the Deep South during the 1960s. That actually, I think those parts were some of my favorite in the book, because uh, at those points, you know, we're just seeing, uh, like, there's a very tense situation, right? A white guy gets lynched in a deep southern rural community. In the 60s. Everybody's, in the 60s, everybody is on, like, extreme tension. You know, uh, there's, at some point, there's a race rise. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, so, no, there would like, be. It, no, it's, it's like a really difficult situation. Like, you know, this they don't, like, sugarcoat it. You know, the cops are clearly corrupt and racist. Uh, there's KKK members, you know. there's the, And here in the middle of this is this guy, uh, the first black uh, FBI agent, who suddenly thrust into this case because, you know, a white guy got lynched. Therefore, you know, you, 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 there has to be, uh, you know, some kind of perception, you know, that there is something going on here. And... It just gets worse and worse. <laughs> yeah, right? that's, um, that's rough. But I, I will say, so, so far, the story sounds really interesting. Like, uh, it feels like... this Is the 60s thing also... Because it feels like there's sort of like a supernatural element to this. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm getting to that. Uh, so here's where I think there's like one of the first big spoilers of the, of the thing. So I guess this is your second and final warning, right? You can get off the trade if you don't want to have this book spoiled. So... What, sep- what connects these two people, Odessa Hardwick and Earl Solomon, is a man by the name of Hugo Blackwood. God, all of the names in this book are so good. 
<laughs> I know, right? Hugo Blackwood is a very, you know, very sort of cool. I instantly, you know, naming people is hard. When I hear the name Hugo Blackwood, I instantly have a picture of what he looks like. Yeah, he's and got I'm like glasses and a suit and a hat. <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> well, yeah, he definitely has a suit, right? Uh, so it turns out that uh, supernatural things are going on. Um, Earl is an interesting fellow because he was basically a pariah in the FBI. It turns out that um, over the course of his very long career, he was involved in many, many supernatural incidents, uh, including, of course, this one that he was in uh, at the uh, lynching in the Deep South, right? Uh, there's supernatural elements, there's demons and ghosts and other things that Earl is forced to confront. And by his side is a man by the name of Hugo Blackwood, who himself also has secrets that he's buried, right? There's like a three-way perspective where you're at like 2019, then you go back to 1960, and then you go back to the 1500s, where Hugo Blackwood is from. What? Yeah, yeah. Is he, <laughs> Blackwood is is, he a vampire? No, no, no. Blackwood is a character... He was an occultist, right? And again, like, there, there are references to, like, real practices of occultism, right? Real secret societies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Blackwood was involved in an occult ritual in the 1500s that basically cursed him with a supernaturally long life. Uh, however, what a curse! Uh, <laughs> however, he's forced to perpetually deal with uh, supernatural things. So um, that sounds like a really though... good deal for him. He was an occultist. That was like his germ. <laughs> that would be like if if what? someone said like, "Oh, you can live forever, but you have to play video games." <laughs> I'd be like, "Oh no." Well, it cost him very dearly, because his beloved wife, Ophelia, was also killed in the process. Oh, so um, he's, he's a detective with a dead wife? <laughs> well, he's not really much of a detective. Uh, what he I detects. find interesting... <laughs> he inspects, right? He's an inspector, not a he's detective. He's an inspector. Right? <laughs> inspector. Uh, yeah, no, so what I find interesting about this is that here is a man, Hugo Blackwood, uh, who's life basically intersects all of the major characters in some way shape or form um and you slowly start to see like odessa gets drawn deeper and deeper into this supernatural conspiracy right that she's uh, a part of and they have to face like real problems like one thing that i i think this book doesn't shy away from is just there's a lot of like okay like so sometimes in a lot of like supernatural shows you know some of the violence is very like i don't know airy you know it's very insubstantial you know this book opens with a woman shooting her best friend basically and uh being traumatized by the by that experience because she at that point had never shot anybody before and in the span of like an hour she kills two people <laughs> um hmm. and uh you know the the whole thing about the lynching that was like really intense right because you just feel like oh yeah you know even if there's no ghost involved yeah there's gonna be problems because a white guy was lynched and you know a few years ago, four black people were lynched. So it's like, what's going on here? You know, uh, yeah. that's like a very difficult situation. Uh, and then, of course, you deal with the stuff with Hugo, who is uh, deeply a wife guy. And he gets involved, you know, as you do in the 1500s, you hang out at the wrong occultist's mansion. <laughs> and then suddenly, you know, your your life gets <laughs> flipped turned upside down. You really um, love that phrase today. That's become your new thing. <laughs> I've been watching. I've, I've I've watched. I was watching a review for the new Bad Boys movie, and I guess I, I've just been thinking about Will Smith. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering something about Will Smith that's totally unrelated to that TV show he did. <laughs> but you know, um, I do uh, I do um agree with you that uh, especially in like supernatural stories, the violence is either like crazy gory, but it always happens to a sort of unrelated character. Mm -hmm. And then they they save sort of like the big moments of of violence for for other characters once they lull you into a sense of security. It's interesting that this book starts off with like here's a fully realized side character that you totally expect to be sticking around for a while. He's gonna die. Yeah, no, I I'm like, oh yeah, we've got the rookie FBI agent and the veteran FBI agent. This is our dynamic. And then that guy dies, and you know everything gets uh, uh, to be of, replaced like, by an spread. even more veteran. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what I so what I find interesting um, about Hugo as a character um, is I really do mean it. He's not really a detective; he's more of an inspector. He is very much uncomfortable with the modern world. In order to contact him, you have to drop a envelope in a mailbox. <laughs> um, you know, he doesn't know, he doesn't know how to use computer. He doesn't know how to use like modern technology. He drives around in a Rolls Royce. Um, oh my God. He's skullduggery pleasant. 
I I find it very endearing, right? Uh, because he contrasts very nicely against Odessa, who is an FBI agent, right? If there was one person in our world who was going to be solving like deep mysteries and stuff like that, it would be somebody who works for the FBI, right? They get the weirdest cases. Um, and I, you know, I mean, yeah. I don't know about that. What do you mean? Like, I've, I've, the the bureau has investigated some really weird stuff. I mean, they're the ones who are like dealing with serial killers and. Yeah, you know, yeah, uh, no, they they investigate weird stuff, but it's always sort of grounded in reality. I never would have thought like they would waste resources on supernatural things. Well, you see, that's the thing, right? That's why Earl was sidelined. He was dealing with supernatural stuff all his career, and basically he got sidelined uh, for it. You know, he wasn't he was he was never promoted to like a senior agent position or anything like that. He always stayed as a uh, so just like a basic agent, you know. Um, because it's implied oh. that the Bureau, I think, like, did a cover-up of some of these things, um, you know. Uh, so let me, let me ask you a question in yeah. this, uh, uh, our book club slash court. If you had to summarize this book in, like, a sentence or a paragraph, how would you paragraph. do it? Okay, um, a modern, a modern person has to unravel an ancient conspiracy before everything gets destroyed. That I think is probably because this this book is about fundamentally the past and the future colliding, right? Okay. All through the all through the perspective of a guy who has been there and done that, right? Um, what I do like about Blackwood Hugo is that he's not necessarily all powerful. Um, most of the time that he does like magic, because he does like occultist magic, um, he has to be really prepared to do it. Otherwise, you know, he just doesn't. You know, he's not he's he's not like um, who's a good comparison. He's not like uh, Doctor uh, Strange. No, yeah, he's not like Doctor Strange, he's not like uh, uh, Dresden, he's not like Harry Dresden, he's not like that kind of, you know, sort of... Uh, oh, you pulled out the reference I do not understand. <laughs> you, know, you know, the Dresden Vials, uh, for those of you in the audience who have read that, uh, um, you know, paranormal modern uh, fiction book, uh, he's got a, a Jim Butcher, you know, he's got a, you know, Harry Blackstone Copperfield Dresden, <laughs> Chicago's first and only wizard detective. What? <laughs> What? <laughs> I thought the Dresden Files was like, I, it's like something Dan Brown would write, like the Da Vinci Code, where it's like, no. oh, we're, here's a puzzle. I'll give you the answer. No, no, no. Uh, you know, the Dresden File literally are Jim Butcher's first publisher, uh, publisher is telling the story of Harry Blackstone Copperfield Dresden, Chicago's first and only wizard PI. Why does he have eight names? <laughs> I don't know. The, the, uh, these are my three dads. They all I, chose to keep their surname. Well, you know, uh, wizards and their, you know, their magical names. There was a brief. I think there was like an attempt to make a TV show about it. Uh, look, man, don't, <laughs> don't come, <laughs> don't, don't come at me with the Dresden Files. All right, uh, that's a that's a time. You for came at day. me with the Dresden Files. <laughs> I was hoping you would know the reference. <laughs> No, I I literally handed you a reference in Skullduggery Pleasant, <laughs> who is also a wizard detective. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, so so yeah, you know, it's uh, Hugo knows a lot of stuff. He can do magic. He can bind demons and do all of that stuff. But he's also like very detached from regular people uh, in a lot of ways, and he's not exactly a pleasant person to be around uh, sometimes. So we kind of have this whole Sherlock Holmes. Uh, uh, John Watson kind of dynamic, except for the fact that I think Odessa is actually generally more competent and she's more important in a lot of ways to the story than Hugo is because she's the protagonist. Firstly, um, well, I mean that that's still Watson esque. Watson yeah, no, was I, very competent in the stories. No, exactly right. It's it's not a good Sherlock Holmes adaptation if Watson is a moron, right? I'm looking yeah. at you, BBC BBC Sherlock. Yeah. Um, it it so I you know I I was thinking about this. One reason why I wanted to talk about this book is because I'm really really obsessed with the idea that if you're going to write detective fiction, I feel like some of the best detective fiction has a good dynamic, right? I think you need yeah. two people to actually like deliver the detectiveing, right? In in a, in a way that feels both natural and also allows the audience to simultaneously figure out some things for themselves and also, you know, like, get some necessary exposition that they might need to, like, figure out the clues. Because Odessa is an FBI agent, so she approaches everything with this rational 
uh, cold, uh, well, not cold, but like a rational, logical explanation. You know, I'm an FBI agent. Let's, you know, do, let's follow the procedure, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, yeah, yeah. Hugo has a guy who's covered in tattoos <laughs> who works at a <laughs> tattoo shop. <laughs> oh, and, yeah, you'd never, that's the weird part. Yeah, and he has like magical powers and he's keeping demons in, in like these tubes. Uh, you know, it, 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 it it's, it's a very interesting sort of situation, right? Uh, especially because. It also is based on its own mythos. There's not like another mythos here that's, you know, being taken out of. Uh, it's very much inspired by, you know, those types of detective stories, those types of paranormal stories, but it is also its own thing. In, in a weird kind of way, I would feel like tonally it fits the vibe of like John Constantine the movie, you know, not John Constantine the character, the, the comic character, you know, the movie with Keanu Reeves, which is getting a sequel, by the way. I'm very excited for that. Hey, I have to watch the first one now. Yeah, it's. I think it's good. I think it. I. I, I think it, like Peter Stromar as the devil is a absolutely amazing costing choice. <laughs> the devil uh, is in that movie. Yeah, yeah. How did they get a hold of his agent? <laughs> well, you know, it's, I don't know. I feel like he'd be in like a, a book somewhere in like Harvey Weinstein's office. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you have to go to a bathroom, draw a pentagram, and like throw a goat at it, and then the devil's agent picks up. No, no, no. Harvey Weinstein picks up, <laughs> and he'll just page the devil. <laughs> <laughs> he pages the devil. Yeah, yeah. The devil doesn't have access to modern technology beyond the 70s. Yeah, no. He just prefers a pager, you know, because otherwise you know, people can just yeah. get him on, like, everything. He'll, so, he'll fax his headshots over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, yeah, so I, I do think the story is really good. I think the, the fundamental mystery... Um, as I got towards the end, I think I sort of figured out everything that I needed to figure out. But on the other hand, you can, you know, you viewers at home, you know my record. I play a lot of detective games. <laughs> I play a lot of these detective games. So I am more familiar than I think the average person is. But I really did want to know. You know, I, I sat down and I read this book basically in one one sitting. Uh, that's how Whoa. that's how interested I was. Uh, it's about, I think, 300 pages. So it's not a huge book. Yeah. Uh, but, but still, like, you, you're pretty swamped for time. Yeah, Most yeah. Time. And, and like <laughs> for you to sit down and do one thing. Yeah, I to give you, you know, I I play games for the channel more than I play games for my own personal recreation. So yep, <laughs> that's that's just you know how it is. So I I really did enjoy this book. Um, I think uh, it's part one of what's called the Blackwood Tapes ser series. So there are going to be other books, which uh, I'm hoping it does. It does bother me that his surname is Blackwood. Because I came up with a character called Blackwood that I put in my book, and now I'm I I remember that, and there's also a character in the uh, R D J Sherlock Holmes movie that's called Blackwood, and now I'm worried that Blackwood is just not a very creative name. It's it's a cool surname, right? It's evocative. Is it's what very it is. evocative, right? Because you know, sinister forest and all of that jazz, right? I think it's I think that's interesting, certainly. Yeah. You know. But yeah, I, I think um, another thing that I might compare this to a little bit uh, is the third season of True Detective. Have you seen it? No. So I really like True Detective. I feel like that first season of True Detective is some of the best television that's ever been made. Uh, I have less positive feelings about the second season. I I have mixed feelings about the third season, but I do think the third season is interesting. And the, in the third season, it follows the perspective of a black uh, police detective who was investigating a weird crime that happened in the South. And um, you flash back between him as an elderly person and him as a younger person. And I do get a little bit of vibes from here uh, of that, but I think this differentiates itself, of course, with the supernatural element, uh, firstly, yeah. but also because um, Hugo Blackwood is there as well. And then he's like, you hear, you hear the, the, like this, you know, this black FBI agent being like, what is this British guy doing here? <laughs> <laughs> what is this Victorian man? <laughs> <laughs> Why is you know, he wearing a tunic? Yeah, you know, they have this interesting dynamic because, uh, you know, Hugo is a white guy and that means that he, by default he doesn't get treated as badly as this black FBI agent does. Even though Hugo is just a civilian in this context. He has like no professional, you know, capacities or whatever, which is also interesting, right? Because Hugo knows a bunch of stuff about supernatural things. But it's clear that Odessa is capable of like just doing detective work, you know, and sort of yeah. doing, you know, other stuff like that. Um, I do think the book, towards the end, it speeds up quite quickly, where I feel like a whole bunch of plates are spinning, and then suddenly, like, one by one, they just start falling, and maybe, you know, you might potentially feel 
that the pacing is a little off. Uh, I know certainly that uh, some people might be put off by a, a character dying. I don't want to spoil who dies, but there's a character death in there that I think some people might have, you know, not necessarily appreciated. I thought it was fine. But um, yeah, you know, I think that this is a, a story that is intriguing. Um, and I definitely think it's worth your time. Like I said, I felt like the foreshadowing here between a horror director excuse me, a horror director and a, um, a crime novelist produce something which is very similar. Of course, it mirrors, you know, of course, Odessa and Hugo's strange partnership that they've got going on, you know, and uh, it, uh, it definitely has, you know, it definitely has some very good moments. I think, I think it, it I, you know, because I'm almost, <laughs> I'm almost out of time for my segment, but um, I think it also works uh, well because it balances that line, that it walks that knife edge between supernatural and like crime stuff, I think really, really well. If it had yeah. too much of either of those things, I don't think the story would work. The supernatural stuff would no, feel I, like I get you. If if it's like too supernatural, the crime stuff would feel irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. Like, why or do like I need it would to be lessened? <laughs> yeah, like why do I need to do detective stuff when you can just cast a spell and like figure out you know what happened or whatever. Uh, meanwhile, if... or even just like, why does it matter that this terrorist is happening when like Cthulhu is coming? Yeah, you know exactly. And also, if there was too many supernatural elements, uh, I mean, sorry, if there were too many crime elements, then the supernatural elements would just feel weird and out of place. It's like ancillary. Yeah, it's like uh... a vestigial. <laughs> yeah, like you're having a serious crime thing, and then off in the corner, you've got like <laughs> Blackwood, <laughs> just fucking wizard cop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it'd be like, you know, if it, it would feel like, oh, yeah, and then Gandalf the Grey shows up. <laughs> He's like, Gandalf just the like, Grey, FBI. <laughs> Odessa is just sitting, standing there like, we're going to have a serious conversation. Here, Hugo, float this apple so people remember your magic. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it, I, I think it, yeah, because the other thing that I think is important is that nobody believes Odessa about all of this magic stuff. Uh, she basically is forced to work with Hugo against her wishes because literally nobody takes her seriously uh, because she shot her partner, right? I think it was super important for that to happen um, at the beginning of the story because otherwise it'd be like, hey, this lady is an FBI agent. She has like huge amounts of resources. At the beginning of the story, it's like, yeah, let me just phone these people. Let's get, you know, helicopters in the air. Let's like, you know, let's get a jet to shoot down that that plane, you know, uh, that's terrorizing the city. It's like they had so many resources, but because she got ostracized, it's like, actually, nobody wants to talk to you um, you know, you have to, like, do back-channel stuff to, like, get DA and things. Uh, I felt like that was, like, necessary for the story, because she has all these skills and stuff, and she has a gun. <laughs> Hugo does not have a gun! <laughs> <laughs> all the magic in the universe can't stop my Colt 45. <laughs> you know, we were talking about Harry Potter before the, uh, before the recording, and I'm just like, yeah, you know, a gun would have solved a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have before when we get into my section. I have some words about Harry Potter. Yeah, so I I, I highly recommend this book. Uh, I think uh, if anybody um, you know uh, if you're going to read a, a book like this, I think you know go ahead. Um, I would recommend that you probably maybe wait until like more books are coming out because I think it would the book does end on a cliffhanger. Um, I'm fine with that, but you know if you if you want to like see if the story is going to actually expand, because I don't know that the other books are actually out yet, um, you know, just check uh, and then you know maybe give that a look. But I think it's I think it's highly highly worth your time. And yeah, that that's me. That's the the hollow ones. Well, let's um let's let's take a different road down fantasy lane. That's a good metaphor. I just <laughs> you can tell that I drive a lot. Um, Instead of going down like dark and spooky supernatural horror, why why not in like funny super Emilio? Help me, I'm stuttering. Help. <laughs> yeah, so we thought it would be a good idea. See, we plan these out, viewers at home. This is not a stream where we're completely off script. <laughs> uh, so we thought, hey, you know, I'm going to talk about something serious. I'm going to talk about a, a more serious kind of thing. Why don't why don't you know you finish us um, finish the the episode with something more lighthearted, something you know, like a palate cleanser, like a nice sorbet. After a, a heavy meal of like noir. smelling coffee beans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a nice boba. Um, oh man, I could go with a boba right about now. Uh, but um, I yeah. hate boba. <laughs> Another reason. Boba is like, okay, I've always said in my life that sparkling water tastes like an unwanted foot rub. I like sparkling water. And you're a freak. <laughs> and boba tastes like someone 
touching me in public and I don't know who it is. Okay, so are you saying I'm the Hugo Blackwood of this podcast? <laughs> you are absolutely the, the nasty little Victorian freak of this podcast. Which is an interesting position for me to be in. Because I've never been the serious one. <laughs> so what are you but talking speaking about? Of, if you've seen the the thumbnail of this video, you already know it's a pretty famous one. It's another manga, because I guess that's just my flavor. It's called Mashle, Mashle. Magic and Muscles. Oh yeah, I've heard about it. It's the sequel to, yeah, to Heroes is... of Fight and Magic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it... Have... <laughs> It's this is the sequel to Heroes of Might and Magic. You made that fucking joke. <laughs> and I'll make it and I'll make it again. <laughs> I'll do it again. Um so Mash Mashle is a story about uh, a world in which every like most people, like 80% of the population are born with magic. Mm-hmm. And you can tell that they're born with magic because a line appears on their face. Almost like uh, you're born with like a tattoo. It's always a line. So, well, sometimes it's like different shapes, but it's usually a line. Uh, the more lines you have, the more like initially powerful you are. It's. Uh, I think they they gave the stat that like one out of every one hundred thousand people is born with two lines. Okay. And uh, like being born with three lines is ridiculous. That never happens. He's got three lines, Kakarot. What could that mean? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like that in the story, yeah. But, like, uh, the, the the whole thing is that, like, magic in this world is uh, considered to be a gift from God. Okay. Uh, so God or, is like, real. Or, like, the gods or whatever. So the the Betty... Well, no, no, no one knows that. Okay. It, it's just sort of got, like, religious implications. Cool. So the better you are at magic, the more, like, close to the gods you are. Like paladin. Uh, sort of. It's, it's like... um. It's it's almost like a uh, royalty. Mm. Okay, so like it's the like closer you are to royalty, yeah, yeah. Uh, because you're generally born with a certain magic capacity. Uh, people kind of have this like inbuilt belief in this world that like you're born with talent or you're born without talent. Mm-hmm. Okay, and like no amount of hard work can can uh, overcome that. However, there are some people in this world who are born without magic. They don't have a line, and uh, they are... Muggles, basically. Ooh, what's the good word? There isn't one. They're culled. Oh, no! <laughs> yeah. It's, it's an idea that, um, like, you, you get rid of the weak ones, because there's no way they can stand up against wizards. So you get rid of the weak ones so that there's only strong ones. It's very bad, and it's never presented as a good idea. I do have a question. Yeah. So what? You, so you're saying that basically you're born with magical powers, right? Um, yeah. And so is there like an explanation for why some people are? Because you said they do calls. So is there like an explanation for why there are just some people who are born without magical powers still? Or no, no one knows. No one knows. It's okay. it's treated kind of like as a mutation. Okay. Cool. Um, so, and also, you're, you're not born with, like, inbuilt magic, you're born with the capacity to learn magic. magic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the other thing about this world that, uh, I personally find it very interesting is that wizards are in charge. Okay. Which makes so much more sense to me. Yeah. Than, like, wizards being in hiding. Yeah, why would they, why would they be a secret, like, society when they are objectively more powerful than everybody else? And this is why I wanted to talk about Harry Potter. Ah, I see. Because... It doesn't make any goddamn <laughs> sense that the wizards in Harry Potter are in hiding. Yeah, they should be running things, right? Yeah, because, like, there's no limit. Mm-hmm. Ma- Harry Potter has a soft magic system. There are, like, three rules, and they always get broken. Mm-hmm. The rules are you have to own a wand, you have to do the appropriate wand gesture, and you have to know the name of the spell. Yeah, so... Okay, yeah, so I, that that feels like... <laughs> <laughs> Those rules get broken yeah, all the time. I'm just as I'm thinking about, it, like, yeah, I could totally think of times when they didn't do that. It's like they just flick their hand, and they're not saying anything, but a spell happens for some reason, you know? Yeah, it's and it's fine if you have like a character like Dumbledore do it because it's like, oh, he's supposed to be strong. Yeah, he's the, he breaks the rules, so we know he's strong. Yeah, he's the arch wizard or whatever. But like then, just later on, fucking high school kids <laughs> are just like, f- <laughs> like swinging their wands and a thing happens 
and like even okay so you you know the harry potter video game that came out recently uh hogwarts legacy, hogwarts legacy? yeah there's a section in that game where uh, the one town gets like destroyed by a troll or something, and then you have to go around repairing it. And literally, you are like a 16 year old <laughs> what? who is waving their wand and repairing buildings. Oh my god. <laughs> what on earth can humanity do to wizards that forces them to not be in charge? Maybe they don't want to be in charge because it's too much work, and they're just like... That's what I'm thinking. Like, like if you have the capacity to both, as a child, mm-hmm. essentially be a nuke, or possibly cure cancer, and you're not using it for the world, then you're a dick who is trying to... It's like elitism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, you could save the world, but actually you don't really care, so... Yeah, you're not interested. Fuck you, wizards. <laughs> anyway, it makes a lot of sense that in the world of Mashley, wizards are in charge. Uh, and that brings us to our main character, Mash Burn Dead. <laughs> which is a great... That is... Okay. You're gonna hear some good we, ones. We are, we are on a roll today with good names <laughs> for characters, but we're yeah. on the opposite spectrum... <laughs> <laughs> why the names are uh, good so, <clears throat> so mash burn dead lives with his adoptive father mm-hmm. who um was it, throughout his life he he wasn't very good at anything uh so no one really wanted to be around him and he was considering like throwing himself off of the uh wall of the one city mm-hmm. but he stopped because he heard a, a baby crying and was mash and he decided to look after him and teach him, like, how to be a good person, even though he can't do magic, which is illegal. You're not allowed to shelter what they call lack magics. Okay, they're like, that's the word for muggles. Lack magics. Yeah, basically. Okay. And basically, uh, throughout his life, Mash's dad was like, hey, you should work out. And he did it so that uh, Mash would, like, be able to protect himself, just in general. Uh, But Mash got really, really into it. (laughs) To a, uh, a ridiculous degree, and now he is essentially a god. Um, <laughs> uh, it, the comic literally starts with, like, um, my name is, uh, I forget the dad's name, it, it starts with an L, but he's like, I'm something burn dead. I'm a, a chic older man. My <laughs> hobbies include tea and reading. And when you get to my age, things don't really bother you. And then Mash walks in, having broken the door off of its hinges again, and this guy just screams. <laughs> okay, Callum, uh, I have this picture in my head of, like, Johnny Bravo. <laughs> no, okay, so Mash Burn Dead looks kind of like a, a your regular anime boy, but just, sort of with a ball I just cut. Need it. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my God. Uh, no, I just. I really like the the way this guy draws characters too, because they all have ridiculously skinny this legs. This is so funny, because I don't know. Is this from the way that you describe the fact that he like broke the door? He just he just sounds like if Johnny Bravo were in Harry Potter. <laughs> it kind of is. It's like um, he's just sort of stupid. Like he's weirdly eloquent, and he um. Oh, this this is a comic where people go like, "Hey, you're in my personal space." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's clearly written by a, a more modern manga author. Uh, one of the characters is confirmed non-binary. Oh, okay. Um, which is cool. It's not it's not like a big deal. I don't think we should give them a medal, but like it's nice to see a manga author just say that instead of being like, "Oh, it's ambiguous if this is a man or a woman." Oh yeah, yeah. I, I do kind of hate that. A, a lot of anime is like. They go out of their way to make it's a just character androgynous. to to be androgynous, but you know they don't say like, "Hey, that means something to that character," or they choose to present this way, or you know whatever. I mean, then, then again, some people are just androgynous in real life, but you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, this character never makes like a big deal out of um, you know what they look like. It's other people who do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but um, it's it is interesting a- anyway. So. To continue on with, I'm, I'm essentially going to be summarizing the first chapter because I think it, it's the best way for people to get the vibe of this story. Uh, Mash is very, what's the word? He's like very, he accepts responsibility for his actions. Oh. And you can tell that he feels bad. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. That's quite unusual so people, an anime protagonist. Co- yeah, so people like forgive him easily. Uh, but he goes into town. Uh, his dad has to go into town for for business, and he says to Mash, like, "Hey, don't 
go into town. I know I tell you all the time, but don't do it. And Mash uh, goes into town because unfortunately there's a, a, a sweet sh- a store, a bakery there called Goblin Cakes that makes cream puffs, which Mash is obsessed with. <laughs> Goblin Cakes. <laughs> That is his defining character trait. He he works out and eats cream puffs. I mean, I respect, right? You know, uh, you could you could do. I cream puffs are pretty good. I mean, you could, you can make like a full on croque and bouche. Uh, you know, that's like a whole that's like a whole deal. Mm. Croque and bouche. That does sound good. Um, but mash mash is uh, his like ultimate goal in life is to become a patissier. I respect the hell out of that. <laughs> he wants to make like yeah. macarons, uh, you know, and like a uh, delicate little. Uh, well, it's paws. because he wants to make cream puffs. <laughs> that is very anime. Oftentimes, in a lot of animes and manga, you'll have like a guy whose favorite fruit is like, you know, fried chicken or whatever, and then he's like, "I'm going to dedicate my life to making the the perfect fried chicken or something." Yeah, there's a character that, that non-binary character I mentioned later when he meets Mash eventually. Uh, Mash is like, "Do you mind if I eat this cream puff real quick?" And he's like, "No. Do you mind if I eat this shrimp?" <laughs> and the, they're just like staring each other down, and he's like dipping the shrimp in tartar sauce, and it's like, "Uh, do you, you want some shrimp with that tar? Like, <laughs> do you think you have enough?" And the guy's like, "You fool! I'm not eating shrimp with tartar sauce. I'm, having tartar sauce. I'm eating tartar sauce with <laughs> shrimp." <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, this comic is so that, it's so like weird that is such an amazing line so, oh my word <laughs> it's this comic is so weird but in such like a good and interesting and funny way uh the fights are fun to like watch uh the 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 it, there, there are moments with genuine gravity and character development mm-hmm. and growth in a comedy you see we were we were we were talking about this um one of the problems that i have with the mcu is that they don't allow moments to exist right everything's got to be a yeah. joke you brought up the great example of dr strange having this serious emotional moment he's putting on the cape you know uh well, this is a this is something I saw on I think the the channel was Hello Future Me, where uh, he's talking about uh, bathos, which is like when you undercut a serious moment with a joke and it ruins the moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh- and there's a, the comparison he makes is to the second Sam Raimi uh, Spider Man film, where Spider Man decides to quit being Spider Man and he throws his costume away, and then later on he gets his costume back and he puts it on and it's this big dramatic moment and that's a movie with a lot of jokes in it but like they don't undercut that moment it still makes you feel like this is a powerful moment and a similar moment happens in uh dr strange when he puts the the like levitating cloak on to signify like he's accepted his position he's going to to make the most of this he's gonna go and be a hero and then while the music's like building up to a crescendo, the cape like touches him on the face and he goes like, no, stop it. And it's just like, it, it ruins the moment mm. and it, it makes the whole movie seem less substantial. Yeah, it's because the, the movie is, is like, if I don't punctuate every space, every silence with something, you know, that's a, a failed opportunity. But in reality, you need those moments to make the comedy actually stand out more, right? You need a moment where somebody is actually being serious for somebody's joke to actually feel, you know, like it's not background noise. Yeah, and, like, there, there are very good moments where even even characters who are ridiculous, like, there's a, one of the main characters, Lance Crown, mm-hmm. his defining character trait is that he's supposed to be, like, the, the genius pretty boy rival. Yeah. But he's... Uh, He's obsessed with his little sister. <laughs> so he like his little sister got a disease that uh, removes her ability to do magic. And his parents were planning on abandoning her mm. because of that. Uh, so he he uh, refused to let them. And he wants to become what's called a divine visionary to like find a way to save her. I'll explain what a divine visionary is in a moment because that relates to the whole story. But um, he is obsessed with his little <laughs> sister to an unhealthy degree. Occasionally during the the comic, you will see him fly across the screen and hit a wall because he looked inside of the locket he wears at a picture of his little sister. <laughs> That's... 
but he still has good moments of like being genuinely competent and you know emotional growth and getting closer to the people around him mm -hmm. i do have a, a question and, though if yeah. you'll indulge me uh what how would you say the comedy style of this manga is like like what would you how would you say that they do try to sort of like is it sight gags are we looking at like funny things happening in the background uh is it mostly verbal jokes what's like the the main it's kind of a mixture there's a lot of visual comedy mm. With this, uh, where the like the characters are, the drawings get simplified mm -hmm. to express like how incongruous everything is and how much they don't like believe that Mash is doing the things he does. Uh, like there's a, a fight in which this guy uses like puppet abilities to try and take control of your uh, like body, and Mash just like punches through it <laughs> and everyone watching goes from being really incredibly drawn to very simply drawn going like huh excuse me <laughs> and that's that's good that's good visual comedy but there's also a lot of like word comedy mm. mash is incredibly sassy and sarcastic i like that i think i think you do need that to uh like sell stuff right because I think the strength of a visual medium like a manga is that you can't have like little jokes like when i was reading dungeon meshi yeah, sometimes there would be jokes in the background or like stuff that only makes sense in a visual context. Uh, but your writing still needs to be good, right? Uh, because yeah. you can't carry the manga on that alone. Yeah, nothing annoys me more in manga than when uh, oh, uh, Najima used to do this a lot in its manga is when they just have like walls of text. Mm -hmm. Like characters will be explaining something and it's just like paragraphs upon paragraphs of concepts and it's like i know that this is complicated right i know that you're trying to explain an idea to me but you can't just do like you you have to simplify it otherwise i'm not gonna like the biggest thing about najima is that when i got to the end of the comic i had forgotten half of the characters names and like most of how the magic system worked because if you're writing 300 plus chapters of this mm -hmm. I have a lot to remember. You have to make it simple. That's why, like, One Piece is such a, a brilliant comic. Because there's a lot going on, and there's a ton of characters you, you kind of have to remember because they generally will be showing up again. But everything's kind of simple as well. Like, like the explanation of people's powers is simple. Generally, uh, sometimes you get a more complicated one, but for the most part, it's simple. I, I and you can you you read it once and you get it. Yeah, I've heard that. Like one of the selling points, I think, about one a game like a game, <laughs> a uh, a manga anime like One Piece is that you can boil down every character to a single, well defined, remember memorable kind of trait, and then you can make them more complicated later. But uh, you know, for the purpose of just because that has so many characters. Um, and you wouldn't yeah. be able to remember them all, uh, if they weren't that way. And it's, it's really interesting because, like, several of the main characters only get traits later on. I mean, uh, there's a, the, one of the main characters, Zaro, one of his big personality traits is that he, uh, has no sense of direction. Okay. Uh, and that only really comes into play quite a bit into the manga. Like, it, when you first meet him, that doesn't factor in he's just sort of like everyone thinks that he's an asshole but he's actually nice <laughs> yeah that is a common trend in anime um yeah but it's also just real quick before we get back to mashley there's a one piece video game uh i there's a bunch of them i don't remember which one it was in but if you play as zoro your mini map uh gets fog over <laughs> no that's cool <laughs> that's a that's a great attention to detail whoever made that game anyway uh so mashley Mash can't do magic. Uh, he's going into town to buy some cream puffs, and he witnesses a cop, like, exerting power over someone. Oh, no. Like, someone bumps into him or something, uh, and he goes, like, what are you going to do about this? Like, he messes on the... or well, this, this person messes on the cop's shirt. And he's like, w what are you going to do about my uniform? And Mash just, like, walks up to him and fucking rips the front half of his clothes <laughs> off. <laughs> okay. And he's like, I'll wash this for you. <laughs> Man, he is and just, just like Johnny Bravo. Yeah, he, but he's genuinely, he's like, he's not malicious at all. He's, he just, like, doesn't understand that that will happen. 
<laughs> he's got does he have himbo energy i i i swear this he's he's a little too like sassy mm. to be a himbo he is very dumb and very kind and very strong but there are definitely moments where you you get the impression that like he understands how ridiculous everyone else is but he doesn't know how ridiculous he is mm. okay yeah i mean that makes i sense. mean at the end of the the comic one of my favorite jokes in the comic, uh, spoilers, Mash dives into the ocean because there's this huge magic that's going to crash down on the continent, and he starts doing, like, butterfly kicks, <laughs> and he moves the continent, and then two characters are like, it's the continental kickboard! <laughs> and one of the characters is just like, but no, <laughs> you can't just give it a name. That doesn't explain it. Yeah. And the other two look at him and is like, I don't know what you want from me, man. It's the Continental Kickboard. <laughs> I love that. That's hilarious. It's so good. But yeah, okay, so... Sorry, I keep getting sidetracked. Um, well, MASH... Well, you know, that's the thing about manga, right? Like, manga is not as... It's, it's not as centralized as a novel. You know, I feel like there's a lot more potential for side stories and stuff like that in manga than there there is in a novel, you know? Because like it, oh yeah if you, definitely. If you go you can you can have whole arcs if you go too off the rail life. in a novel people will stop reading your book <laughs> but yeah. uh, you know there's a I, I've heard tell that there is filler in One Piece dare I say it um, um, there's not filler in the manga I think there there is well you can I suppose consider some things filler but like the manga is generally pretty filler free. Uh, the, I think the it's the anime TV show. Yeah, because they, they yeah the they anime. don't have enough. Like it's not finished. I think if that if I'm real. Yeah, well, the reason that the the reason that filler exists in anime is because the anime catches up to the manga, mm. and the the manga takes time to to get ahead. So to give it that time to get ahead of the the anime, so that they keep like adapting the story properly, they come up with filler. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that that that's. Like uh, the I don't think they do it as much. I don't know if they do it as much these days. I think uh, anime takes longer to make now. Or rather, like, they don't go for, like, weekly anime airings mm -hmm. anymore. They, like, release the whole season for, like, streaming. So they they just, like, make the season and then let the manga get ahead. Okay, cool. But, um, well, to to just finish this, this bit, this is the important part of the story. Sorry, my cat's going nuts right now. Um, MASH essentially assaults a police officer who reports to his senior, uh, it gets revealed during this altercation, like, Mash's hood gets knocked off, and people can see that he doesn't have a line. <gasps> He's busted. Uh, and then his dad, like, and then his dad rushes him home. This police officer goes to his superior, who was, like, a big shot in the, in the magic industry, or the magic ministry, or whatever, and he got, like, he became a detective uh, after his career kind of went downhill. And he goes to Mash's house to, like, apprehend him. Mm -hmm. Now, they, um, Mash's dad, like, forces him to leave so that he, he will be safe from the police. Uh, the police come and, uh, like, start beating on Mash's dad to get information about where Mash is. Who, currently, Mash was sent to go and work out again. <laughs> uh, he finishes it really quickly. And he comes back and he's just, like demolishes these cops like the one cop sends off a magic blast uh, and the other cops like that's the one he used to kill a dragon and then mash just like swats <laughs> it out of the air <laughs> he like he volleyball punts it into the ground <laughs> that's funny uh so the the cop realizes that he's not going to be able to beat mash and this is where the impetus of the story happens he says to mash hey i could expose you as a lack magic. And then you and your dad would never have a moment of peace. You would be constantly hunted for the rest of your life. Or I could enroll you as a fake student in this magic academy that produces divine visionaries, which are like the leaders of the, the government. They're like the top agents of the government, the best magic users in the world, the closest to God. And if you become one of those... I will live off your prestige for the rest of my life, and I won't tell anyone you don't have magic. Whoa, that's a that's that's a hectic bargain right there. That I hate to say it, that feel, that feels like a Harvey Weinstein deal. 
<laughs> yeah, but um, Master decides to accept the deal because really? I thought he would um, say no, or I I don't know, like. Well, his dad said no, but he accepts the deal so that he can like live in peace with his family. But also later on, that his goal kind of changes to becoming a divine visionary so that he can force the magic populace to accept people without. Whoa, magic. okay. That he can <laughs> prove that like effort is stronger than talent. That has that has really that actually has like changed. That that's really interesting, right? Like you hear you hear you have a guy who's like, "Oh yeah, I want to. Why do I want to become God so I can force radical equality on society?" <laughs> <laughs> it it works out really well. It's it's a very good. I again, I don't want to spoil too much about this. I I think reading it really gives you uh, the best possible experience. Mm. Uh, it is, it's one of those comics that you start reading and it makes you laugh a few times, and you go like, "Ah, oh, okay, this is gonna be cool," and then you keep reading it and then it gets like genuinely interesting mm. and like yeah mash is like stupid and irreverent and he says the wrong thing all the time and he's like he simplifies shit so much and he he's so compelling as a character because everyone else is like oh my family they they taught me the strongest magic <laughs> and i will be the god of this and then mash is just like you're a fucking idiot. I'll punch you in the face. <laughs> and then he does, and it's great. I do I do love that, right? You know, I, I mentioned, of course, you know, that uh, Hugo doesn't carry a gun. Well, Odessa has a gun. <laughs> and it solves a whole it's, lot of problems. It's, it's the real gun magic situation again. <laughs> it solves a whole Except, lot of problems. Except uh, Mash carries guns. Yeah, he's got the guns, but, you know, his, his guns are... He's got the gun show. Yeah, you know, he's got the muscles. I just, you know, it is it, one of my favorite things, actually. It, it I feel like a lot of people are really weird about this. You know, there are like some people who get obsessive about, you know, fantasy versus magic or whatever. I'm not one of those people. Uh, but I do think it's just absolutely hilarious when you have a situation where it's like, oh, yeah, we're struggling. And then it's like, oh, yeah, well, what did you do? Oh, we just ki- we just shot him. <laughs> we, just, we just shot the art lich. <laughs> He's made of bones, so a bullet would just explode. <laughs> you know, I just... I, I, yeah. No, no, no go, go ahead. I, I really love it, too, because, like, um, because it's a parody comic... Mash is allowed to be ridiculous. Like, there's no, there's never given a reason as to why he is just so ridiculously strong. In fact, characters pointed out, like, you, regardless of how much you work out, you shouldn't be able to do this stuff. Yeah, I feel like. And <laughs> it, but it just works. Cause, like, characters would be like, I'll crush you with 10,000 times gravity. And he's like, okay, I'll walk harder. Yeah, no, exactly, right? Like, I feel it works in the context of this story because it's a parody. Uh, you know, it's not taking itself too seriously. Because uh, I, I find that those types of jokes are the funniest when they aren't being taken seriously as much, you know. Uh, but, you know, when, when, when somebody's like trying to expand that and to make it much more a thing, that's when I find that it actually start, the wheels start to go off the wagon a bit. Well, that's just the thing is that like, because this this manga has its serious moments where characters sort of drop the jokes and and just say like oh you know you hurt my friend i'm gonna put you in the ground then um it does carry weight like the the art style i think the the fact that it's drawn as well as written lends a great degree of credence Mm -hmm. to it like the fact that he simplifies drawings to illustrate jokes is such a big brain move (laughs) Because it means that when the drawings are, like, serious, when, when you see, like, detail and everything, you know that this is a serious moment. Yeah, yeah, I think... So it's a good visual shorthand yeah, I think... that, that adds to No, I, yeah, exactly. I think that's actually a great way to sort of explain it, because that is actually the process, right? That's why some things work and some things don't, and because there are these uh, visual shorthands. Uh, yeah, I think... Yeah, I think that's that's also why, like... The Marvel example we gave doesn't work because Marvel movies it always looks the same, so they they have to use like other techniques. But because they don't, the jokes fall flat. Yeah, sometimes. yeah. I remember, I remember seeing. I think it's the Black Widow movie where there's like an explosion that happens behind Black Widow, but because nobody in the MCU wants to like actually have a shadow, like you know, put their actors into darkness. Scott, uh, uh, Black Widow's face is brightly illuminated, despite the fact that there is an explosion happening directly behind her. 
that should cast a shadow over her face, but her face is completely view- viewable. You know, it's like that's why I like the the, the Dune movies, the Denis of uh, the Denis movies, because he knows how to use shadow. He knows how to use the light. You know, uh, that stuff really makes um, it really makes it uh, m- much more of a visual feast. Okay, so eventually we're gonna have to make a show called Sight Marks, <laughs> where we talk about movies. <laughs> Because we have a lip- opinions, yeah, and apparently. Then, then but we need to make yeah, one called uh, Fine Marks, which is about... <laughs> <laughs> Boxing. Um, thank you so much for watching. Uh, these these are our books, The Hollow Ones and uh, Mashley of Magic and Muscles. If you know any other fun fantasy supernatural stories that you want to tell us about, feel free to do so in the comments below. And let us know what you think of our stories. Would you read them? Do they sound like your kind of thing? Have you read yeah, them? Yeah, let us know. Uh, take care, everybody, and goodbye. Oh, wait, uh, before we, before we get going, thank you so much to our $5 a month patrons, Liam Anderson, Dorian, and Discordance, for helping support this content. Uh, you may have noticed that this video was announced, uh, like a week ago. That's because we were going to start trying to put more videos up on the Patreon and the YouTube memberships first, so if you want to see the videos before anyone else, those are the places to be. But in the meantime, if you don't have the funds for that, uh, don't worry about it. Sharing, liking, commenting, all of that stuff helps us along. And just watching is, is very nice. So thank you very much for, for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank, uh, thanks for that. And also, uh, remember to like the podcast as well. That We do have a podcast. It is available wherever you get your podcasts. Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> all right, uh, Emilio. Uh, give me, give me one use you would use magic for. Go. I would use it to bake, uh, the most delicious baked goods ever. I would never touch the ground. <laughs> yep, yep. The ground would be done we, with me professionally. We are, we are, compa- we are definitely companions on the next doctor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye, bye everyone. everyone. <laughs>